Hello and welcome to part two of the series of the Complete Beginner's Guide to English Paper Piecing. I'm Debbie Donegan from Everything Country in Telegraph Point, New South Wales, Australia. Um, if you're following along on our English Paper Piecing Stitch Along, we'll be here um, doing the sewing up of our hexagons today and learning how to put the hexagons together and if they were to go onto a piece of fabric, how to go about that. Now, in this particular one with the hexagons, we won't be putting them to a piece of fabric, but if we were, I'm also going to show you how to do that. So a little recap of some things first. Um, last week in the series one, step one of the videos, I covered all the basics for English paper piecing. So we talked about things like our threads, our needles, our fine pointed scissors. So um, we had our different threads. We talked about the differences between silks and cottons. We talked about needing little fine, sharp embroidery scissors. We talked about our shapes and our papers. So again, if you have the option when you buy your papers, and I buy a very good quality um, stock card that is put out by Sue Daly here in Australia. Um, it has a lovely silk finish on both sides of the temp on the cards. So the glue just comes off without tearing away at the paper. It's high quality. They're all die cut, they're precision. So if you pick up one, you pick up 10, they're all going to be exactly the same, um, which is a real advantage when you're wanting to use your papers. So my advice is if you have the option of buying your papers and your template together, to always get the two together. Um, you can buy them in packets of just the papers, you can buy them in packets of just the templates, or you can buy them together. And my advice is always buy them together. Buying them together allows you to fussy cut from your fabric. So for instance, I've got this lovely little one here and I was able to put the template over where the fabric sat. And you can see that the quarter inch allowance, the little dots on the template there are running all the way around there. So when I fussy cut that from my fabric, I could tell exactly what's going to be on show and then what's going to um, be out in the seam allowance and it told you exactly where to cut it and you can get repeat ones if you're wanting several to go around your design. So if you have the option, template and paper together is always my advice. It actually costs the same so it's not an advantage cost-wise one way or the other. Um, what I will tell you is some of the shapes, and I've got a couple here, and I did touch on them briefly last time, but if you were to buy something like this, which if you see the size of that against my finger, one of them, it's a quarter inch, little quarter inch hexagon, and believe it or not, there's a hundred pieces in there. If um, you cannot get the template that's going to go with that little weeny quarter inch piece, um, and that'd be one that I would just put on and cut your seam allowance and there's not too much fussy cutting that's done in that. Um, I will show you one in a moment that is done at that size and how gorgeous they are but how small they are. So quarter inch you generally don't get templates with and again at the other end of the scale. So there's my big four inch, four inch clamshell. You can see the size of it with my hands as opposed to um, we normally deal with uh, here's our two inch. This is our two inch apple cores and clamshells and you can see there's a mighty big difference between what's in there at one of those sizes to what's in there at that size. And again, you'll find it hard to get templates at that size. Um, they're not used often on the market and um, you can generally put it around and just add your extra quarter inch allowance for cutting it out. Um, now, having talked about those little teeny weeny quarter inch ones that are gorgeous but tiny, here's a present I had done for me by um, one of my students quite a long time ago. And that's got the quarter inch hexagon, but it's the round edge hexagon flower. So it's got the curved edges on it. It's got all the pieces in it. There's a lovely little flower in the center and it hangs off my teeny weeny scissors. So you can see if I put that quarter inch one 
on the back of this is a three quarter inch hexagon the whole shape together joined up seven of them is still smaller than the quarter inch hexagon shape so they're really tiny you don't need a template for something that tiny and if I come in nice and close you can see how small every little one of those is and how small the little one in the center is gorgeous but not for the brand new beginner unless you're a throw it to the wind and go in at the deep end then you'd, you'd start at quarter of an inch but my suggestion is always start around the three quarter inch mark um, one inch mark our hexagons are lovely and big we're dealing with the template of this size for our um, stitch along our Christmas stocking stitch along and there's our paper inside it with the extra quarter of an inch seam allowance all the way around so they're lovely big pieces you're going to be surprised how quick they sew together compared to the smaller ones it happens really lovely okay so we talked about our papers and our templates our threads that I use silk thread as a preference and why um, and then between the Daruma brand and the Daruma brand and the Guterman brand so that there's a lot more sheen in this Daruma brand they generally come in a lot a um, lot more brighter colors and this blue on here in the Guterman brands denotes that it's 100% silk Daruma brand again 100% silk and they both glide through the fabric beautifully um, I'm not sure that I mentioned in video one that um, therefore hand piecing so anything fabric to fabric by hand so English paper piecing we're joining fabric piece to fabric piece by hand needle turn applique we're appliquing something onto a background with fabric to fabric by hand and uh, bindings binding on a quilt when you're doing the back piece and you're sewing the fabric to the background fabric by hand that's when I use my silk threads they're not for going through your sewing machine okay they don't like that high intensity fast heat that your sewing machine generates so fabric to fabric by hand for your silk threads the other thing I covered last time is about going darker rather than lighter and I will go into that in more detail today so that we choose the right thread for our two pieces of hexagons we're putting together. Um, I did a little recap and talked about our boards. So I had our lovely rotating board that you could put your hexagon piece on your fabric you could put your template on your fabric and you would just cut around it and the boards would rotate so all of those things if you have them they'll help you out greatly um, so we've passed all that for today we're now going to go into the sewing of them and getting them sewn together which is really exciting and um sorry <laughs> almost put my head in the camera um also just a little bit more detail so that if you were doing it in a quilt how I actually choose the colors to put together it, it's I'm not a random picker I might do scrappy but I think about it very carefully what I'm using and why um, so even though it appears scrappy I'm very controlled and I pick what I want to use and why so having said that if I was putting generally when you're putting something together and you're making the grandmother's flower garden so the design that goes round in a circle so here I have one that's grandmother's flower garden the traditional hexagon in the middle and the other six pieces are going around the edge generally you want the fabrics to coordinate together so they have a coordinating comfort level of color in there but you also want the contrast so again I've gone for that high level of um, rust and tans and browns to contrast against the creams that are in there and that makes a good hexagon if I show you another one and this really doesn't matter what colors you deal with again in my um, these are our lovely rich Japanese fabrics oh, I've got dragonflies here so again I've gone for dark navies on the outside and a lighter um, tealy blue on the inside you'll see that there's dragonflies up here that have got that lighter blue in them 
um, that sort of French blue. And so that coordinates really well with that, the different size of the scale prints and everything. But there's still a relation between this outside fabric and the opposite fabric. They coordinate, but they contrast. And even if you were to look at the runner behind me there, um, and I've chosen very dark blues up towards the section here and creamy light blues down here, every single layer contrasts against that white in the center piece, the cream piece. Coordinate, but contrast, and you'll get really good results. So again, um, here I've got red one where I've gone and put the navy inside, or I could go and put, because this one's got lovely little cream circles and things inside it, I could put cream inside that and that'd look just as lovely there. Um, so I pick something that relates to each other um, in the fabrics. So when you pick your fabrics, and I'm just going to turn you down to the board now so that I can show you some different examples of what I'm talking about. Um, because once I pick my two fabrics to go together, I then pick my thread that I'm going to use. And you don't need a great palette of threads. Usually you're dealing with two, maybe three threads between your whole project. Um, but it's what I pick and when and why. Okay, I'll just turn you down for a moment. Okay, so I'm just going to move those ones to the side. Alrighty, so we've got our board here and what we've got is a, a lovely French type blue in our hexagon. And I've picked one here that's other lovely hexagons that go against it and they contrast against it, but they've still got that lovely French blue in there. So I would be very happy to be making a... Um, grandmother's flower garden, a pin cushion, anything like that, because they're contrasting, but they're also complementary with our blues really lovely against each other. And you could do a lovely little running stitch with some embroidery thread around here and it'd tie it in even more. So they would make beautiful project together. Um, and I would be very happy to choose them. If I did that, what I do when I'm sewing mine together, depending, and I'm going to teach you two different methods today. So one of them is a whip stitch, which is what 90% of the majority of people would use when they're sewing their hexagons together. And um, it would be what color to use in your thread then. And the other one is a flat back for our stitch when we're sewing flat. And I used to do the whip stitch for about the first 15 to 20 years. The last three years probably, I now do them all completely flat and 100% I don't get any stitches showing and I'm very pleased with that. And generally when the girls come along to class with me now, I'll teach them the uh, flat back stitch as the main stitch to learn to put them together. And they will still get shown the whip stitch but only as an alternative to use if they wanted to give it a go. It's generally not what we would use. Okay, so coordinating but contrasting for my fabrics that go together. Um, even when I pick up scrap, I'm still picking something to go together and why. So if these two were getting sewn together, what I would aim for is a thread that goes with both, but I always stitch it up with the darker thread colour. Now, you don't have to have exactly the right thread colour. So if I was to look at this, there's a very French blue and there's what we call a, a creamy white. Now, I've got a few silks here that I've pulled aside, saying that there's generally that I carry a light blue and a warm blue um, and I pick the darkest one of those to use. Now some people in their stash just carry um, a very neutral tan type one. You can get away with it but again just for the sake of two threads I like to have two that move. If you don't have exactly the one that you need always go darker rather than lighter and I've got a dark grey and I'm going to show you why now. So if I unravel these a little bit, and I'm just going to pick that out of there, and I'm going to lay it between the middle of them. Now, if I were to open that thread out, and I'm going to bring you right over the top of that, and hope that you can see, if I were to lay that thread out, you always see that lighter 
thread sitting there. But if I were to do the same with my dark blue, and it could be the same level blue or slightly darker. So again, if I lay that dark blue between them, it now recesses back into the dark color. And I'll raise that up. And you don't see it there at all. It just recesses back into your darkest color and you won't see the stitches. So even though I'm going from a cream to a French blue, I would choose that dark French blue as the thread that I'm sewing them up with. If I didn't have the right one and say I had this grey, which you can see is very obviously darker than with that, it would still be way less visible. And I'll put that dark grey one there and hold it up to you. And you can see that it recesses into that background level as opposed to if I went and put a white or a cream and laid it across there. I'm just going to lay it whoops, across there at the same level. And when I stand that up, if it'll stop twisting on me, when I stand that up, you always see the thread, always. So I never, ever go for the lighter when I'm sewing the two together. I always go for the darker. So having said that, it would be this French blue. And if I didn't have the right French blue, it would be the darker grey, going darker, not lighter. Okay, and that would be the same no matter what um, colour fabrics I picked up to do my things in. So again, I've put two together here. I'll just bring them into screen at the moment. I'll move those out of the road. Put two into screen. These are colours. I'm very much a country warm palette. So I've got a beautiful red and then our dark brown. Um, two completely different. I would choose to use the red thread. It's darker and richer than that lighter brown and it will disappear into the seam. You will not see that thread um, when we sew those stitches together. So that one would be the red thread. Just Okay, here I have two cream ones. So if I had that one there and that one there, Again, they're a very dark tan. Um, I have threaded up, and you could thread up the red thread. It would disappear into it, or you can thread up the tan because there is tan all the way along there, particularly when you get round to these edges. They're all tan. So if it was um, a red going to the tan, I would definitely have the red threading because it's the darker one. Okay, and one more scenario. Again, if I've got a rich dark blue joining my line, I've already got some in a row and I'm about to put a dark blue onto a lighter blue, it's the dark blue thread that I'm going for. And when I hold it up, you will see that there are no threads at all. And I'm just going to move these threads off so they don't roll out of the road. There are no threads at all on show between that white and that blue because I've put the blue in when I sewed them up. So this dark blue, even though I've gone from cream to a light grey, light blue, dark blue, the dark blue is the only thread colour I've needed to do that whole lot because in each instance, it's the dark blue that is the darkest one. So my tip for you that if you're going to do them as a whip stitch, that you pick the darkest thread colour and you pick the darkest um, hexagon to be at the back of you. Because whether you realize it or not, when you are, I'll just move these again out of the road for a moment. When you are stitching your hexagons together, what you have at this um, back and it's going to look opposite to you in the camera but when I'm stitching here at this side that is my back one you always put your darkest so again if I showed you those two they're my two hexagons this guy's a lot darker than what this guy is I'm going to have him at put them together where I'm sewing them up and put the darkest one to the back so he's over that back side from me because when you do a whip stitch, you, you're coming from the back 
towards you each time you whip and you don't realize it but you take up a little bit more thread on that side than what you do on the front side at you so um, having the darker one there if you're taking it up with the darker thread you're going to um, still minimalize seeing it now before I do start doing any stitches and I've put it in my needle I'm going to show you this little diagram I've got here and I'm going to remind you that the habby system the haberdashery system is opposite to our counting system so where have we got that there we go the habby system is opposite to our counting system so for needles that are 9 10 and 11 9 being our smallest number is the biggest needle in the series 10 11 being the biggest number means it's the smallest needle in the series and if I turn you down even more so that you can see this very clearly on this hexagon that I've set up there okay and I'm going to turn it around so it faces you and hopefully not disrupt them all from their positions I've just gone and drawn on a hexagon for you and when we talked in um, series number one keep still series number one of the thing if you've got really good 2020 vision you would aim to use this number 11 straw milliner's needle it's got the lovely fine shaft the nice thin eye if you've got little bit less than that you go for the number 10 and like me I've just deteriorated in glasses recently um, and well I, I'm at number 10 now but if I deteriorated more I'd then go to nine they are still exceptionally fine needles they've still got exceptionally fine eyes so you're using a lovely silk thread that's nice and fine with a fine needle at the other end I've got one over here and this is number 15 and you can see that it is longer, longer shaft, finer eye again still. So it's um, very long and very fine. The longer your needle is, it means that the needle is taking all the pressure. You don't end up having pressure in this thumb hand part of where you stitch. You don't want, I'm just going to turn this up again for a moment. Okay, when you're stitching, um, this part here can take on a lot of pain if you're really tight how you stitch then that gets a lot of tension if you've got a long needle and you're putting the needle up and down through it the needle takes it and you'll see it'll start to get a bend after a while particularly with needle ten needle turn applique um, it's actually turning the needle that creates the bend and that's a good thing because it means you're actually doing the stitch correctly so um, number 11 milliner's straw needles I've got them in the lovely Sue Daly brand they're my most recommended then if you have trouble um, loading them a 10 or a 9 and each one is lovely and long and fine so I've gone and preloaded up some needles and I'm going to show you the two versions of stitching them together okay so this one here again how I told you before I've got the two blues, a much darker blue and a lighter one. I've got the lighter one at me and the dark one over there. And I'm going to show you in the whip stitch. Now, regardless of what I do, when I put my needle in, I'm making it go up through the seam between the fabric and the paper. When you've used your glue, you can't stitch them together straight away. You have to leave a little bit of time. So once they've set and dried, I can just get my nail in there and loosen them off and get in under that and it's particularly easier um, so you can see that I can run my needle all the way along there now and it's particularly easier when you've cut them with the with the um, warp and the weft of the fabric the straight this way or straight that way you can get your needle in under there so I'm going to load my needle in there and again, when I start off, and I'll just show it on this hexagon here again, I start an eighth of an inch in from the edge. And when I stitch, I stitch to that outside corner, come back across, 
and then come in an eighth of an inch again. And the reason I do that is when I tie my knot here, I want the knot to be contained within the body of the hexagon. I don't want the thread and the knot hanging outside the hexagon area. And I'll stitch across, get to that corner and stitch back in an eighth and do a knot again. And that means every little section of the hexagon is getting secured by a knot. So if, heaven forbid, they came undone for some reason or you had to cut a section free for some reason, every side is secured and I like to use my thread and work it continuously um, but doing that eighth of an inch so having said that I'm coming in with my needle between the fabric and the paper I'm on the lighter side and I'm about an eighth of an inch in from the edge and that will put my knot in the Thing. Now, when you are doing your whip stitch, you want them to be lovely and straight. If you do your stitches and they're lovely and straight over the top like that, you're not going to see them. If you start to slant your needle on an angle and take your stitches as a whip stitch on an angle, you're going to see that the thread crosses over like that and you're going to be able to see that thread cross. So just a nice, taking about two threads worth of fabric and whipping it over the top again going back to this corner remember that I've started here and I'm going to go out to the eighth of an inch on the edge and then I'll work my way back over there and it really is just a whip looping over the top of the two fabrics keeping it nice and straight coming at me if I bend that needle and thread I'm going to see those threads um, so it takes perhaps um, five six stitches until you get to the very edge and again I'm just going down a depth of about two threads worth um, and now I can make my way back over to I've already stitched that together and I'm making my way back over to that eighth where I started and we'll start moving across this side of the hexagon and start stitching across here. Go all the way to the corner and come back in the eighth and stop and knot it there. So I would just continue doing whip stitches like that. Now the reason we go down a couple of threads is we do not want to pull the... Um, or the weave in the hexagons if we only catch the first thread there's a really good chance that you're going to pull it so you can see that I am just continually whipping over with a straight needle facing straight to me and just doing a whip over the top oh, I've just got a little there we go bring it back over again straight to me not on the angle remember we don't want it slanting we want it coming straight from the back to the front i've got the darkest hexagon at the back now i can open this up and show you that there are no and i'm going to put it really close there are no stitches on show now hopefully that's not too blurred at that level but if i bring it out and bring it in there are no stitches on show where I've sewn that up. Okay, so that's the whip stitch. And you would keep going all the way till I get to the end and then work back in an eighth of an inch and put a knot there. Then I would just go to my next one and put my next one on because I'm doing this in a long row. If I was going around the hexagons, I would put my next piece here, here, here. And keep working those with my continual thread but as I said I knot off each section as I do it so that everything is secure in one piece as I do it now I've also got a pin in this piece here because this is one that I hand basted so you can see on there there's the little needle turn pin you can see the hand basting thread basting thread that's around there and I did that in the white to stand out very well um, against one that's glue basted and you get a much 
firmer, tighter hexagon on the glue basted one. So again, I've just shown you that you can put them together. They'll still meet perfectly when they're on the front. They still meet at edge to edge each piece and you stitch across there. Um, and that bit there is the bit I've still got to sew, but they'll meet perfectly and I'll finish it with a knot, uh, the number eight knot. So what I'm going to do is just put a little knot in this now and then show you my flat stitch. So again, to do my knot, whoops, if you get a knot as you're working, just put your needle back into the center of it and pull it back away from you so that it's released it again, so that you're not tightening the knot. If you pulled it towards you, you'd be um, tightening that knot and not getting it out. So what I'm going to do is do the little whip stitch over. And to do the number eight, you go in through the front of that loop. So there's a loop there, in through the front of that loop, and flick over in through the front of this loop. Now, all the girls that do classes with me learn the number eight um, as a part thing that would do. Because I'm wanting to hide these stitches, I've got navy on navy, so it's a little bit hard in this example to actually show it to you. Um, but it's in the books. It's very good to learn if you know what you're doing. Now, I'm going to cut that off. I did a knot there. And I'm going to cut that off. I'm going to put a knot back in my thread. Leave a little quarter of an inch tail at the end. And whether I'm using cotton, silk, whatever, I always leave that little quarter inch tail hanging over the end of, you can see where the knot is in the quarter inch. Um, all cottons breathe they'll breathe and you don't want the knot to come off the end. Now, the different one here is if I was putting these together as my little clip on there, I would have a clip to help me hold it nice and flat. And this time, all I'm doing is going back and forward um, like a ladder stitch does. Now, exactly the same as what I taught you before, I want the needle to be straight. So see how it's crossing from one side to the other? Nice and straight. If you put your needle on a slant angle, so you've got it bent like that, you're going to see that gap where it goes on its side. So always cross the bridge between the two of them nice and straight. So again, I'm just going on a layer from this side between the fabric and paper to that side between the fabric and paper and pull it through. I've got um, minutely, you know, three or four stitches along and I'm bringing it back. Again, the next one. So for those of you who know ladder stitch, um, it's just like doing a ladder stitch. And if I pull this apart slightly and you get to see um, that needle in there, you can see how straight I've got it between the first one and the second one. And that will mean the steps on the ladder are straight. If your steps are wonky, your stitches will show. And I'm just going to accentuate that on this piece of paper. If this is your ladder, so, do it with the darker texture. Where is it? So if these are the two rungs on your ladder, which is the folds, you can see how that relates to the fold of this fabric and the fold of that fabric. What you are creating is the steps for the ladder stitch. Um, if your steps, and you'll see that I've got them going across nice and straight, if I then go and put one in this way and it's on a thing, that whole area becomes visible and you don't want that. So, so long as your stitches are straight from one side to the other, you're not going to fall off your ladder. You're not going to see your stitches. And that's when you're sewing up things that are stuffed, a heart, anything like that. If you've got straight stitches in the folds, you won't see it. 
So again, um, there I am pointing straight from one side to the other. Moving just a couple of threads along, always between the fabric and the card. Move up just a few threads. Now this is taking me um, longer than normal because I've got it right away from me trying to show it at the camera for you. But a few threads at a time between the fabric and the card and that is straight ladder stitch all straight like this again i would work to the end and then come back in an eighth of an inch and do a knot to knot it off now when i turn it over this side i've only got a um, little weeny bit at the end left to do but none of my stitches are on show you can't see a stitch at all now you mightn't think that's important, but I have a lovely present that was given to me. And I appreciate it. Love it. The person is very experienced. Beautiful pincushion given to me. And I can see, and I'm just going to hold it up here and hopefully the um, zoom is able to happen. I can see a thousand tiny stitches a thousand tiny stitches everywhere I look all the way around the project I can see every one of the stitches and they're all beautiful they're all done in a tanny color so it's a very much neutral this type of thing neutral tan they're thousand tiny stitches but I can see every one of them and it's because they've got a slant to them and because there's darks and mediums and lights and that one colour has been used between them and it's picking up too many threads on the angle. Had those same stitches been done straight across, it doesn't allow the fibre of the thread to be seen. So hopefully you can see that beautiful pin cushion that I was made. Lots of intricate shape. Love it but a thousand stitches on show and generally when you look at the projects that are presented to you in magazines and they do the up front stitching you can see every little stitch that's in it and it's by very experienced um, patchworkers within Australia or overseas whatever you can see a lot of the stitches whereas if you go to the darker thread and you keep your threads straight you will not see them so I'm just going to pull this little pin cushion very cute little hexagon pin cushion and it doesn't matter whether I've done the caramel to the brown or the caramel to the blue and this is very heavily stuffed you cannot see any of the threads okay and it's because in every instance it's the darker thread color that's chosen when and that they're stitched straight so going back to my other examples that I showed earlier and I was being, here we go, I was trying to be so organised this time of everything being together. If I was sewing these two up and it's red and brown, my red is darker, I would be choosing to use a lovely red thread. I've got my size 10 needle. If I was doing it as a whip stitch, I'd put them together and I'd put my red at the back so that as I'm doing my whip stitch, you don't realise it, but you dig a little deeper as you're taking your threads from the back. So you have that dark one with your dark thread at the back. If I'm doing flat stitch, which I always choose to do now, I have one of my little clips on. So you've got a third set of hands now there you can't see it because that is the cream selvage actually there but that is glue basted all the way around um, just getting my needle in my nail in to loosen that bit of thread from sticking to the papers there when I go to put my red thread in that's already got a knot in it again I'm making sure that my needle and thread are straight not on an angle I'd start an eighth of an inch in from the corner and just back, forward, back, 
forward to that corner and then work myself away across to this corner and back in the eighth of an inch and a knot okay and by doing them now I'm only going to start in the middle here just to make this nice and quick again um, you don't do it when the glue's wet so there we are going between the paper and the thread I'm just progressing along say three stitches worth three threads worth just doing a couple of stitches and I'm making sure each time it goes between the needle between the fabric and the paper and that it is always straight at me it's not on a slanting angle because if it's on a slant you'll see the stitch and I'm just gonna do a couple more and hold that in there turn it over for you and I've gone from a red from a brown with red thread um, so here I am stitching along and you will not see a single stitch on show so I love that flat ladder stitch on the back of your work so a flat back okay when you've got them all sewn together in whichever way you're doing whether you're going round in circles or whether you're going up and down in straight lines when you have to put it to a piece now in our particular stitch along we're doing for the stocking stitch along we don't have to sew these onto a piece but what I want to show you is same rule applies this is then the applique part of it we are putting this lovely rich dark one down onto my beautiful linen background fabric the darker applique piece I would have the dark navy thread in and stitch it down going around like that to get it on I always leave all of my papers in until it comes time to use it and put it onto the project okay um, again here's some that I've still got the center out so I could use something like that which is lovely I've gone and see there's an opening just there I've gone and sewed up all the side pieces so that they're attached um, but I'm thinking I might put this on my linen and do a little embroidery in the center so I would go around and the thread I would be using is the rusty red because it's the fabric on top being applied to this so in this case I would be using my red Daruma thread um, sunburnty red rather than if I use a cream one you are going to see every little stitch that you do it's going to stand out rather than hide okay so always darker rather than lighter and it's the fabric that you're appliquing on now in our stitching for our stocking that the girls are doing with me for this um let's pop you back up there oops sorry okay so what we've got is um, you are going to get your piece of freezer paper that was given to you in the kit and trace around the template of the shape that's on the pattern for our Christmas stocking and that will tell you when you lay it over your pieces how many pieces you have to put together to make it fill up that stocking bit and as it starts to go around the corner and when you're picking your fabrics to go together pick something complementary but contrasting to go together so this guy and this guy there's um that blue is in this red the red is in this blue so they go together very nicely so again like i talked about at the start you're picking things that complement but contrast so again at this scale i've got a big and i talked all about the scale and things last time i've got a really big scale of beautiful uh, floral here and I've got a medium scale one here that's fussy cut I'm sewing them together if I was sewing them together I would have the red thread in um, start an eighth with the knot stitch out here cross to there and back in the eighth and knot it again and then go on to your next piece um, when this is the darker one so it's the red that I would have as the thread that I'm choosing if I'm throwing sewing those two together and again if you look in there there's complementary colors in each of the hexagons um, and I'm 
picking them to go nice completely different scale to this one and they look great again red against a white it's the red thread i'm doing and i would particularly hold them as um, my flat with my little clip holding it turn them over and back forward back forward until you get to the end come back in an eighth and put your knot okay um, and I also want to point out this is not in relation to the stocking but we've got a beautiful beautiful big runner here gorgeous needle turn on each end lovely dark colors that I love dealing with the reproductions this is one of my students runners and there's a beautiful applique on the end now she's got a creamy background and she's gone and put a very dark almost black it's a navy black onto this lovely um, background when she's putting this fabric to this fabric it's the dark black or dark gray or dark navy thread that she would use to put these on when she's using that one it's a rusty brownie red so that's the color thread that she would use not the color of the background it's the color that you are applying and that becomes the dark one going on to there okay so the same principle applies the darkest thread color you are choosing the color of the applique not the color of the background just the same as with our hexagons and then you won't see a stitch at all now i'm just going to um, show you a couple of projects one is on the door so bear with me for two seconds Again, this beautiful fussy cut runner that Diane did in one of our classes all came from the same fabric, but we used our lovely fussy cutting mirrors to put the template on different parts of the runner. And you can see how she's got very different results across the runner. Absolutely beautiful. Um, almost looks like snowflake icicles. Again, these are six pointed stars. When that is getting put onto our whitish cream background, it is the navy thread colour that matches this top fabric that she's using to applique it onto there. Okay, same principle, darker thread rather than lighter. Alrighty. Now, I've just brought you over to a few of my samples to show exactly the same thing. This is a clamshell roll. Um, some of our beautiful patterns that we have. Sorry, the light's playing with that a bit, but our clamshell sewing keeps. Um, we get to put all our bits and pieces in there. When we put them together, it's the same thing. If I've got that creamy one going on the green one, it's the top fabric going on. That's when I'm using the creamy thread. This is being appliqued onto that one. This is the front fabric. That's the back fabric. That is the red thread that I'd use. So there's your beautiful clamshells with all our gorgeous colors that we use there. Here's my barrel bag. So gorgeous amount of hexagons happening in the shape of a barrel there, hexagon barrel bag. Let me pick it up. Some fussy cut flowers on the front done with our hexagons. Um, I choose the color for each one when this, is getting done it's the navy that I'm using to pop it onto that beautiful background and again we have handmade little hexagon buttons with it, which are really cute there is all manner of gorgeous patterns that we have using our shapes you can see there you can get in touch with me about any of them beautiful projects here I've got all the gorgeous Tilda fabrics and again show you the Daruma silk threads that will go with that. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you're into pretties. Here's the most gorgeous fussy cut pin cushion we've done of um, pattern, pattern, stock them all. There's the fussy cut. And again, it's whatever color is on top that I'm using for what goes on the bottom for attaching it to its thing. All our lovely silk threads in all the different colours that we need. Beautiful, beautiful patterns. This one's got most beautiful embroideries inside it, which when I get a chance to stitch that up. Gorgeous table runners. 
thread and sewing things. Absolutely gorgeous patterns. Lots and lots of things that we can make using our lovely shapes. Here's another example that I've done the opposite. So when I'm sewing, this is again needle turn applique. When I'm turning that heart onto this pale background, it's the pink thread that I'm using. That's getting applique onto the background. It's the pink I'm using. And here I've got the opposite scenario. So these are just little tops for pin cushions that I make. Um, this is the opposite. I've got the lovely floral happening up here with the cream background going on to a pink. It would be the cream that I would use to stitch this on because it's the top applique fabric. Okay. And again, lovely invisible stitches. You do not see any stitch at all. And that's a cream um, thread being used on a dark pink background. When I go next door, it's a dark pink fabric on a cream background. And you don't see threads. Blues against reds. Creams against sort of an orangey pink. Creams against green. It is always the darkest thread in these EPP projects that I'm choosing to do. And again, some beautiful Dresdens. When I'm doing that one and that one together, it is the rusty red that I use as my thread. So you don't need a great palette. Um, all of those used in the side of the barrel bag. So if I hold that handle up, you can see the beautiful side of it. They're all versions of blues and browns and creams. You only need a blue and a brown. In every instance when you put them together, it's either going to be the blue darkest or the brown darkest. So that's all you need. Just over at this section and coming up to the table runner on the wall here, there's some lovely flowers on that table runner. Come back for you. Um, again, beautiful things that you get to advance in each time, whether it's bags, cushions, table runners, whatever. Um, the thread is according to what you are putting together, whether you're needle turning it or whether you're EPPing it. I hope all of that made sense. I'm even showing you at the French Braid Runner. When the girls do these under their machines, they um, have a darker thread in and we use darker rather than lighter and you won't see any threads between your stitches at all. So if in doubt, darker rather than lighter. Okay. For this barrel bag, it doesn't matter, but in every instance, it would either be the darker brown or the darker blue that would be being used. So if I look at these two, I would be having the dark blue in my needle. If I look at these two, I have the dark brown. And it's not swap, 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 swap. I just um, go with the run of which ones am I using the dark brown. And all of them adjoining that would have the dark brown. When I get to a dark blue one, here it is here. There's cream joining dark blue. You cannot see a single thread between any of those pieces that I've got in there because I always choose darker rather than lighter. And there's your lovely hexagon shape again. Okay, so beautiful fabrics, reproduction, sometimes busy, sometimes not. So there's resting spaces, different scales, all those things we talked about in episode. Okay, so in this scenario, I've got a beautiful, rich, Christmassy red, a beautiful caramel with red on it. They are complementary. They have each other's colours in them, but they're contrasting. That would make fantastic fussy cutting. And it would be the dark red that would be my thread. You can choose to whip stitch. You can choose to flat back, back and forward in the thing. Give both a go. See how you go. I love the flat back and um, hope you have a try at both if you need any help with needles or threads or any of the other supplies or stock them here um, happy to help out pop it in the mail anything i can if you've got a question just send me a direct message and i'll help out and um, get you on the way so for the girls doing the stitches stitch along for the english paper piecing christmas stocking if you can go ahead when you're selecting your pieces Remember the direction 
that they're going to be facing in your stocking and choose to either um, whip stitch them or back forward back forward on the back between the fabric and the paper um, and that flat back stitch I suggest you give it a go don't do it when the glue is wet if you're doing it when the glue is wet you're dragging your needle through that as you go to do it if you've got a little bit of a nail just pop your nail in under there and release that so that as you're doing it your thread your needle is actually going from the fold of this one to the fold of that one so releasing that with your nail first um, just allows it to be like the ladder stitch and remember what I said about the ladder stitch if the stitches are straight the steps on the ladder are nice and straight you will not see any thread color if you put your needle in like that it takes up those three different areas and you'll see every stitch going across so try and be aware of stitching back and forward with your needle straight okay I hope you feel confident making your choices of which fabrics to put together think complementary but think contrast think big scale against little scale or medium scale against little scale that sort of thing rather than busy 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 or big ones together um, think about your layout as you're putting them out so there's a lovely spread of where they're all going and um, have fun have fun doing it use your little clips if you need some help to use the clips and your silk threads and I look forward to seeing a photo being pasted on our hashtags remember it's hashtag NBC for night before Christmas and then XMAS for Christmas SAL stitch along NBC XMAS SAL and that's on my Instagram and also hashtag everything country SAL everything country stitch along and posting your photos on that will give us a lovely progress shot um, I'm just about to go online and announce the winner for this last fortnight's prize. I think they'll be very pleased. And that all came about just from choosing your fabrics and basting them onto your papers. The next one will come about from actually stitching these together. So um, enjoy your week. Go ahead and stitch them. Pay attention to the direction and have some fun. And check us out on Instagram at everything country three underscores so everything country and the little line that drops at the bottom one two three three underscores on instagram and you can follow our journey along there um, thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed it and we'll catch you on the next one thanks very much bye